All right, I'm finally doing it. I'm finally reviewing the car that I've been daily driving for the past year and a half, which is the Tesla Model S Plaid. I put 30,000 miles on this car right here, which is a lot. And the thing about this car, I think there's a lot of first impressions out there about it, where people drive it for a week, two weeks, something like that. And a lot of them are right, but a lot of them are kind of like, you have to live with the car to see if you will actually get used to some of these features. And so now, from an owner's perspective, I can tell you which features I like and which one I really hate, because there is one that I really hate. Um, there's also an option on this car that almost no other cars in the world right now have because it was pushed to next year, but I was lucky enough to get it, which is the carbon brake package. I'll tell you about that in a second as well. But yeah, let's review the car I actually own. So let's start with the outside of the car. This is what a lot of people would actually tell you is an older design, which it is. The Model S is a decade old car at this point, and the silhouette is pretty similar to when it first came out, but it's gotten some facelifts over the years. And I'm gonna throw in my subjective opinion here. I still think it's a really good looking car. It's a really nice silhouette. It is a big sedan, obviously, but it's a hatchback for one. It's got the 21 inch wheels on it, which I think help a lot. And we'll talk, like I said, about the brakes in a second. But this is a one and a half year old plaid, so it doesn't have the new headlights, but I still think they're pretty good. You can see the new fog lights up front, a little bit of that active or passive arrow slot going through there. Big grill at the front for an electric car anyway. The front trunk. This is, oh, I should say this is wrapped by the way. So the satin black and how dirty it is, is, is obviously not normal. And there's a little bit of black camo in here and on, uh, on these, I think that was tasteful. Anyway, so the basics as far as specs are, this is a triple motor powertrain sedan from Tesla. It's got one motor between the front two wheels and two motors between the back two wheels. That's where most of your torque is. Obviously you're accelerating, you're shifting off those back wheels. A lot of that weight goes rearward, so that's super helpful. It'll do that two seconds zero to 60 on a prep surface. It's a monster in a straight line. Okay, I'll get to the driving experience in a bit. But also, it showed about 390 something miles on 100% charge when I first got it. We're now 30,000 miles in, and it shows about 365 miles to a full 100% charge. So it's about a eight to 10% range degradation, which is close to normal, a little more than normal, but close to normal for an electric car that you get new. Now you can't talk about owning a Tesla without talking about a key. Now you, you can have a card key or a regular key fob, but I think what a lot of people do and what I do is use the phone, use the app on your phone as the key to the car. Because number one, it's incredibly reliable as far as how close you need to be to the car for it to actually unlock the doors of how close I get. Right there, right there. And when I walk away from the car, it's really well calibrated as far as closing and locking too. So that's really good. But then the app itself has a lot of good features. I mean, you get the unlock and lock ability. You can preheat the car. Here's the interior climate control. You can heat the seats, heat the steering wheel, do all kinds of stuff like that. Beep the horn, see where the location is view charging stats, call service. You can even summon it to you if you're kind of far away across the parking lot. I don't do it much, I don't recommend it, but the app is really good, okay? Then you get into controls and you can see all the controls to open the car. You can see your tire pressure. And this will actually bring you to one of the first things that I don't like about the car, which is that the front trunk is not powered. So it won't open by itself. I mean, it's kind of a bonus to have a powered opening front trunk, but for a hundred thirty thousand dollar car you'd, you'd think that that would be included and there's some other stuff that i'll get to that you'd think would be included but isn't either way pretty decent sized front trunk not huge but not tiny you could probably fit i don't know a duffel bag and a half three backpacks something like that but i almost never use it because it's just it's not powered i have to open it manually every time if i'm in the car like this i'd rather throw something in the powered hatchback which is huge so this does not get much use on the car I actually own. I use it more on other EVs. So here we come around the back. Again, I, I don't know about you, but I think this is a good looking shape. Uh, the lights are flickering on video, but they don't usually flicker. That's how you know that it's a plaid, unless you have the text that says plaid. And if you know about the nice thick 3D one, then you know. A uh, little carbon fiber spoiler back here, but here's the powered opening rear tailgate. I mean, this is a ton a ton of space. I can fit all kinds of stuff in here. And then underneath this is a sub trunk, 
where it's grocery bags, where there's duffel bags, Shrizzy bags, charging. Uh, I have a tire pressure inflator over here. I mean, this is a gigantic amount of space. There's a tiny bit of a curl up here with the dual motors under there, but over here, pull these and they release the seats. So they don't fold down automatically, but you can then fold these down. Ugh. And I have fit two entire bicycles next to each other in the trunk of this car. Now, again, I'll say for $130,000, this should also let me pull the seats back up, but they don't. I have to do that manually. <laughs> so I'll pop over here and put them back up. Now I'll actually start with the back seats here, which I think are uh, decent back seats, but I'll get to interior build quality in a second. But for the size of this car, which is a pretty big car, most of the space is actually behind me in the trunk. And these are okay back seats as far as size. So this is a 6'3 driving position. And uh, I'm, I'm right up against the chair in front of me. If the person in front of you is smaller, the space is better. But comfort wise, I'm all right. It's not, it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, but then you do have this screen down here, which is pretty solid. So this is, again, part of Tesla's extremely minimal, complete lack of buttons in the interior, which is gonna mean, as I close the screen, that basically all of your controls back here are gonna be on this screen. And you can change your HVAC as far as where the air blows and to turn it on or off and change temperature all through the screen. I don't do much of the other stuff, which is watching videos on the tiny screen or controlling the music, but you can if you want to. You can also heat the back seats, but not cool them. Got two USB-C ports down here and some floor lights, but these are decently comfortable seats. And I find, not that I spend a lot of back seat time in my own car, but I find that this is pretty good. There's also a huge sunroof that is very well tinted, which I also like a lot. This is a, this is a solid back seat, but we're gonna talk about build quality and comfort. Let's do the front seat. Oh, by the way, there's another thing. <laughs> when you get passengers, this is the number one thing they don't understand about the car is how do you get out? It doesn't look like there's any handle, but this is a touchscreen button to unlock that latch there. Anyway, front seat. So these handles here are the number one thing that I believe, this is total speculation from me, but I'm pretty sure they're the number one thing that break on Tesla's. It's just the interior, the handle slides in for aerodynamic purposes. But anyway, you get in the car and you are in the cockpit of a jet, basically. This is, in my opinion, a sweet looking interior. I like it a lot. You can see this is the white interior. All the plaids also have the carbon fiber here, uh, but this trim matches up nicely. The shapes are nice, multiple materials here. This is a good improvement, a pretty big improvement from Tesla's of the past. I'll turn my fan speed down so you can actually hear me over that. Um, but it isn't up to the spec of, I mean, you've heard this before, the Mercedes, the BMWs, the Porsches of the world, other $130,000 cars will feel like better build than this. Here's some examples, right? This carbon fiber sheet here is supposed to open halfway and then open all the way. It opens all the way for me, but it doesn't stop halfway. You can hear it try. but that's been broken for most of the time that I've owned this car. If it stayed open, I would also be able to pop this back, pop this back and have a ton of space in here. But also this pops back, there's more storage in here. I like the way it's laid out, but it's just, it's just not the most, there's creaking, there's just a, a little bit of extra wiggle room on some of the stuff you'd like there to not be. It's fine for me because that wasn't high on the list for reasons why I got this car or why I like this car or enjoy it as a daily driver, but it would be nice if this stuff worked, right? Okay, so there are two things that I really like in this interior and two things that I really dislike. You can probably kind of guess what I'm talking about here. I'll let you form your guesses as you watch. But anyway, the things that I really like are actually one, the shape of the yoke. I, I really like it. I think this is one of the things that you, you spend some time with and you get used to, and I, I wouldn't go back to a normal wheel. And this is gonna be subjective. It is a lot more square and you do a lot more of this. And when you're, when you're driving, you kind of have to find those awkward spots where maybe you're doing a full K turn or maybe you're pulling out of your driveway and you have to do a little more movement with it. 
those are the couple of things that you find you have to get used to. Uh, but for most driving, which in America is a lot of straight roads, a lot of subtle turns like this, this is totally comfortable and it gives you much more visibility to this screen here. And then the other second thing that I like is the software is really responsive. Now, again, there's not a lot of, there are almost zero real buttons in this car. I mean, you could consider the hazards even not a real button. Door handles, not a real button. I guess these are the only real buttons, right? Uh, you can still go park, reverse, neutral, drive by touching with your foot on the brake, one of these. Um, but you don't really do that much. You actually end up swiping on the screen to go forward, swiping on the screen to go backward. Um, that brings me pretty quickly to some of the things that I dislike. So here's the two main things that I really, really don't like about driving and using this car on the daily. One, the buttons on the yoke, right? So this is an important distinction from the shape of the yoke itself. Like I said, the, the yoke, you can think whatever you want about it, but they've also chosen to put the blinkers, the left blinker and the right blinker on the yoke in the form of a capacitive touch button. It's not a real clicking button. It does have some haptic feedback, but it's a capacitive button. Your headlight adjusting is also a capacitive button. Your horn is a capacitive button. That's right, nothing happens when you push this. This is just your airbag. Um, your autopilot here, your wipers, and your, your uh, mics for your voice control. I hate this. I really, really don't like this at all. And I, I found it, I was trying to see how long it would take me to get used to it. Fact is, in about a thousand miles, your muscle memory is perfect. You find that you're driving and you know exactly how to hit that button while you're driving. That's no problem. But the button is unresponsive all the time. My right blinker, sometimes I will try for 10 seconds in a row to press all over this thing and it straight up won't work. And I'll just have to merge without my blinker. I swear to God, that's a real thing. This thing is unresponsive all the time. The left blinker, 99% of the time works for me. The right one's just bad. This is hard. I mean, if it was stocks, I would have been cool. If it was real buttons, that would have been cool. But not a fan of capacitive touch buttons in a car. I know Elon keeps saying things like, all input is error. Look, it's 2022. We're not there yet. You need real buttons for real confident input. And that's also true about the HVAC controls, <laughs> which means you got to slide over while you're driving, by the way. So it's kind of hidden a little bit back here and you got to hit the temperature or slide it up and then change your fans and your fan speed like this. Now, this is cool. Like this interface of being able to point the air wherever you want and your passenger pointing it wherever they want. And then there are fans here that are spinning up air and having the air streams collide at a certain angle to send it towards your face or down over the wheel. That is, that is cool. But I also just want like a button to turn up fan speed. The fact that I have to go like this to hit the exact fan speed I want while driving is insane. That is not ideal. Um, if they could update, even just to have like buttons to go right or left to add a little bit or take a, wit a bit from fan speed, that would be nice. This, this is awful. It's cool looking but it's awful while you're driving. All right, last thing about the software. I will say I, the rest of the software experience is really as good as it gets for an electric car, right? I've tested a lot of EVs now and just different car company systems that they've built, Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen, Chevy. Um, as far as like what you want while driving, this does not have Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, which is bold, that is bold. But all the info you get, which is from your Bluetooth of your phone to the Spotify being built in, to the cameras here, to the energy graph, which look at this. This is this is just actually recently added with the software update, but this is sick. Gives you an idea based on how you drive, the elevation of your drive, and where you're navigating where you're navigating to, your live projection of how much range you'll have versus your original projection. That's sick. Um, it's also totally missing a 360 view. Why does this car not have a 360 view? There's a front camera, it's right here. There's a back camera, it's back on the tailgate. There's a camera on that, there's a camera on that. There's cameras in here, camera in there. Why is there no 360 view? That would have been, I mean, that's huge. Most cars I drive these days 
have a 360 view. But you can see the responsiveness is really nice. You can instantly view chargers everywhere. You can view the charging speeds. You can see how many people are at the charger. You can navigate to it. It'll start preheating your battery. All this is great, great software. But that takes us right into the driving experience, doesn't it? What's it like to own and drive a car like this that you charge instead of go to the gas station with? And to be fair, it's pretty much as good as it gets for an EV. This has a lot to do with Tesla's infrastructure, which is the superchargers, which talk to this car, plug and play, as, as good as it gets, which is basically the reason why I think this makes the best daily driver uh, of any of the EVs that I was considering. But there's a lot more to the driving experience. So let me show you something. This is one of the things that are is kind of unique about this car that a lot of others don't have right now, which is this car with the 21 inch wheels has a carbon ceramic brake package. Huge, huge, very expensive $20,000 upgrade to the brakes. Why did I do this and why would anybody do this and would you recommend it? Good question. Um, I'll start by saying that there are a lot of initial complaints and I was one of them about this car's OEM brakes. They are, how do I say this? They're okay, they're normal brakes for normal driving and that's fine for most cars, but this car also happens to accelerate faster than any other production car did at the time, which slowing down from the speeds that it is capable of so quickly requires more brakes, right? So from normal 30, 40, 50 mile an hour highway driving, no problem. These can stop repeatedly. But as you quickly find out when people go to drag strips or do a lot of repeated heavy braking or just spirited driving, um, the stock brakes are, after one or two hard brakes, they start to fade quickly. This is one of the options that you can take, which is there are some other brake package improvements, some other carbon ceramic brake packages. This one is actually really nice. It's very well calibrated, so you don't have to get a bunch of heat in the brakes to initially get that bite from the bigger brakes. They are more powerful right off the bat, and they do not fade. They are great brakes, but they're expensive, especially to replace. Should they have come with the car? No, I don't think so. I think there just should have been bigger, better steel brakes on this car. If you're going to track this car, I would recommend these. I actually wouldn't recommend ever tracking a Model S without improvements to the brakes. These, these birds make weird noises. <laughs> but as you can probably guess by all that talk, uh, yeah, this car is a missile in a straight line. It's absurd. It's obscene. You've seen the videos. You might have even seen my own video when I first got it, the initial acceleration, the straight line acceleration, and just as far as like everyday driving, the ability to just place yourself on the road because of your ability to steer and drive and accelerate exactly the way you want to. It has also a lot to do with the calibration of the brake pedal and the regen. So taking your foot off the accelerator and having it reliably and predictably slow down all the way to zero is super helpful. This car is very, very fun to drive um, in a way that is, is super fun to me. It doesn't handle as well as a Taycan. It doesn't handle even as well as some smaller EVs. Um, but I love driving this car, that's for sure. Oh, and there are also some other uh, unkept promises that I should address with this car. How many are there? I think there's at least two of them. Uh, one of them, or maybe three. One of them was the ability to play a bunch of games in this front console. You can play some games, you can see all of the options here, one of them being arcade. And there are some, but don't they always advertise like cyberpunk in here? That's that's not available, that never has been. I mean, it, this is cool, this is better than most. If you're at a charger and you could just play games that are built into the car or watch YouTube videos, that's sweet. But you're not playing cyberpunk in this car, so that's one. Two is the full self-driving I did a full video on the main channel of just me experiencing it and, and letting it drive me places. It works sometimes on some roads and there will be plenty of updates in the future for it to get better, but it is very much still a beta and I paid thousands of dollars for it to be able to do that years ago. And it's just now starting to be available and still in beta. That's, I consider that a little bit of a botched promise. And the third is, and I don't know if this is still on Tesla's website, but claiming a 200 mile per hour top speed. That's not real. 
Uh, it never has been with this car. It's, I think, claimed that it will require a hardware upgrade. Right now, the car's top speed is like 160, which on any straightaway on any track is pretty much as good as you need to go. And with these brakes, fine. Um, this is not a car I think I'd even want to go 200 miles an hour in, but they just kept saying it for so long. This car does not go 200 miles an hour. It has a max speed in track mode of 175. But that, for me, I think is about it as far as daily driver stuff to consider with this car. Uh, I'll leave it at this. I think this is the best uh, daily driver in the world for me for a couple reasons. I mean, American roads, lots of straight lines, being able to place yourself on the road, the acceleration, it's awesome. It's just a fun car. It has tons of space. And then as an EV, I do a lot of road trips. For Ultimate Frisbee, there's there's games in, I might go from New York to Boston one day or, or to Ottawa or Montreal or Toronto or back to New York or Philly or DC. And being able to rely on the supercharger network is huge. It's a huge part of owning and driving this car. Also having a charger in the garage, starting every day with a full tank, it's great. So yeah, driving people around, driving equipment around, driving alone around, having a good time, I think this is a, a generally positive review for me, but there's just those couple of things that you don't think about when you don't own the car for a while, like the steering wheel, like the brakes, things like that. So there you have it. Matter of fact, one more thing I'll actually leave you with that I think way more cars should have at this price range uh, that only this one seems to have, which are sentry mode and built-in dash cam. Sentry mode being the cameras that just record to the internal computer and you can, anytime someone walks by the car, have it trigger and record. So anytime anything happens to the car, you have a video of it. And the built-in dash cam, always recording while you're driving, recording to internal storage, rip that footage whenever you want. More cars should have that. So now I've been fair, I've talked about things the car should have and not things that this car has that others should. Okay, that's it. That's my review of Model S Plaid, the daily driver for me, for now anyway. Thanks for watching. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.